Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my very fine friends. Uh, welcome to episode 20 of the 10th season of the Tom Petty Project podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Brown. This is the weekly podcast that digs into the entire Tom Petty catalogue, song by song, album by album, and includes conversations with musicians, fans, and people connected with Tom along the way. Today's episode is an excellent conversation I had with Tom Petty superfan, I'll call her superfan, uh, Nora Hayward Olson. Nora comments frequently on the podcast socials and was every bit as personable, warm, and funny in person as she is online. She was also at the Fillmore show where the band played Heartbreakers Beach Party, which ended up on the live album release. Um, that song was only ever played six times live, so it's super cool that Nora was there for one of those performances. So we chatted about that and about how Tom's music has changed for her over the years and all sorts of things in between. So, um, yeah. Sit back, relax, and enjoy, hopefully as much as I did, my conversation with the wonderful Nora Hayward Olson. Tom Petty. Tom Petty Project. Tom Petty. Hey, Tom Petty Project. Okay, well, so... You're in California now. Is that where you were born and raised, or are you a transplant from somewhere else in the country? No, I am a native Californian, I think fifth generation Californian um, on one side of the family, born and raised in Northern California. So yep. uh, I grew up in Berkeley. Uh, so, very famous part of the world. Tech Center, uh, yeah. For the United States, and um, also in Lodi, which is about, which is where I am now, and we're Half an hour south of the capital of California, uh, uh, Sacramento. No way. Like, Lodi is my favorite CCR song. Oh, is so it? That's, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we do feel stuck a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a reason uh, that song has that title. It's so funny because when I, the first, like, I don't know, when I was young, when I heard that song, I thought, like, I thought a Lodi was, I thought he was, I didn't know what he was singing, and I certainly didn't know it was a place. So then when I grew up, I'm like, Oh, that's so cool. Okay, now it makes a lot more sense. Okay. And, yeah. So what kind um, of town is it? Oh, uh, you know, it, it's a medium size. So it used to be more of a farming agricultural. There's still a pretty ag- good agricultural community. Yeah. Uh, lots of grapes. Wine, kind of call it the uh, uh, wine country, the second wine country in California. I mean, I think yeah, almost every part of California is now some kind of right. <laughs> wine country. But that's that's what it's known for for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, craft, craft beer country too and i was i stopped drinking this year but i was a big craft right. beer nerd before and the craft beer scene in california was just like oh my lord it's so oh, good <laughs> the sacramento area now it's like that's been a big thing all these craft breweries springing yeah. at yeah uh, okay, so- oh i was gonna say speaking of ccr um my dad didn't know them but he knew he went to junior high with kids who would go to parties where CCR would play when they were yeah. really young, just I mean, just starting out. Yeah, it's funny hey, when you think about all those. I know the a couple of guys from um, in within the Van Halen world who their dads also kind of went to some of those backyard parties that Van Halen threw. And you just think <laughs> about seeing a band like CCR or Van Halen or Petty or in the Heartbreakers or, or right. Mud Crutch in that small setting where it's really, they're just sort of, they're just figuring out their craft and they're just getting going. And it must have been, it would be amazing to see, go back and see some of those, um, those early performances, eh? Oh, absolutely. No okay. kettle. So what was music like for you growing up? Like what was, you know, what, what was in the house when you were growing up? Like what well, were you listening to? Yeah. I, so my parents were kind of, uh, you know, in that hippie generation, yeah. Um, they both graduated high school in 64, college in 68, and in the Bay Area. So that their influences really influenced me. You know, the Beatles, the Beach Boys, um, the CCR. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Peter Paul and Mary, Simon Garfunkel. So the uh, folk music, a lot of folk music. Um, uh, both my parents directed camps. I ended up being a camp director as well. Um, so yeah. a lot of campfire kind of music. Um, kind of musical family. Uh, my great grandfather played organ for the silent movies. No way. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we were just up in Alaska 
and uh, saw what we think was the organ he played on. Wow! Did he yeah, get to did he play at all? Did he get to play it at all? Or yeah, his first job it, it was in Juneau, Alaska, <laughs> of all places. Wow! Uh, and uh, you know, both sets of grandparents loved music, different types of music, we anything from the symphony to country music. Um, and so those were my, I guess, my earliest influences. My dad played guitar. Uh, my mom played the radio. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they still do. They, they're still with us. Something. Uh, but definitely you know always had music on and yeah uh they were very good about taking us to concerts you know if we really wanted to go somewhere yeah an organ for a silent theater that's such a cool thing right because we were so far removed from that now oh you yeah know, we're, we're sort of two generations three generations removed from that now that it's you know we say to the kids well yeah no there was no sound and you actually had live music but it would have been super cool right because you oh. know they've got the music but each player is going to perform it probably slightly a little bit different so every time you go if you're going to see this show two three times you might not hear the music exactly the same way which would be super neat exactly there are actually uh one of our local wineries has an organ in it and every like once a month they play a silent movie and have an organist there playing the soundtrack oh man come on that's so cool <laughs> i haven't done it yet but it's on my but it's on my to-do list that would be so cool to see yeah i mean i, I think even just with a real organ in a room, yeah, it feels different, right? The music just feels different from if it's being piped in just over speakers. There is something different about that. Sure. Absolutely. Cool. So who was your first, what was the first band where you thought, this is for me, this is my band now, and it's not <laughs> sort of something I've inherited from my parents, or this is this is just for me now? Uh, you know, I'll probably laugh at the irony of the Mikey's. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah big Mikey stand. So from uh, the TV show first and then into the band? Uh, yeah, more or less. I think, you yeah. know, I caught on just the, the reruns uh, on MTV in the, the 80s. And so I started watching. Uh, I, it wasn't even on MTV. It was, we didn't have it. <laughs> it was on some yeah. other station. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and, and my, my my dad, especially, was more, a bit more of a musical purist. And I don't know, what big Beatles, you know. <laughs> yeah. So that was really, I could claim that as my, them as my own. And I've seen them in concert, met met all of them. Uh, lovely the, people. Yeah, there's a, there's a guy in town, Um, actually, a, a friend of mine through another friend. My The guy who does all the music for the show, my friend Randy. He's good friends with him. And he um is a musician from Saskatoon originally, but he lived out in B.C., He's now a an Anglican minister, so he's had quite a journey through his life to get to where what? he is. Um, but he's a like I'm talking when we say a, a, a monkeys fan doesn't cover it. Like he wrote the foreword for Mickey Dolan's his book. Yeah, he's done liner notes well, for some of the CDs. Like this guy's yeah, a, and he does he does a monkeys podcast. I really really cool. Know who you're talking about? Okay, oh, how cool! Well, Mark Liner, you know Mark? Yeah, oh, yeah. No way. This will just keep getting smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard of any of his? Have you ever heard any of his music, his solo stuff, Mark Klein Trio? Oh no, but now I'll have to look into it. Check it out. Absolutely, big pop hooks, guitar driven, really, really cool. And he's a great oh, singer. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Oh, is that ever funny? Hey. <laughs> yeah. Of course, when I heard, you know, a, a recording of Tom Petty and Heartbreakers covering Stepping Stone, I was oh, that's awesome. That's like <laughs> my two worlds colliding right here. Yeah. So, when did you first hear Petty? Do you, do you remember kind of the first exposure to his music? Yeah, so I remember seeing the video, uh, Don't Come Around Here No More. Yeah, the, the Don't Come Around Here No More video, uh, like at my grandparents' house. And, and just sort of thinking, oh, that's kind of funny. You know, I didn't really uh, glob on to the music or anything, but uh, when Full Load Theater came out in 1989, you know, I was on the radio, you couldn't avoid hearing the songs. Of I course. like the songs, okay. And I was thinking about buying the record. I remember this because. I was thinking, about, no, should I buy the CD? You know, you're a teenager with limited spending money. Yeah. And I looked on the back, and the the picture of Tom Petty and the hat and the sunglasses with, with the the ocean bag. It looked so much like this. It's embarrassing. This boy I had a crush on. <laughs> <laughs> the long blonde hair. <laughs> oh my gosh, the California, you know, look. Yeah. Uh, so that. Uh, maybe by the album <laughs> that was <laughs> the editing factor. So thank you, Alan, wherever you are, because you don't didn't know how this was going to turn out. Uh, 
And uh, well, at the same time, traveling Wilburys and my parents were, you know, big Beatles skate. So they were buying, I think, the traveling Wilburys yeah. CD. Uh, so it was kind of funny how that collect. So we were hearing Tom's voice in the house a lot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you know, so then I was a, a you know became pretty good fan since then. So, so yeah, about 1989. Yeah, I mean that's Slumpy the Bros. it's the entry point for so many people, right? That's the sort of and especially into the Full Moon Fever era. We talked to lots of people, and especially our age, it's like yeah, that's yeah. kind of when you're starting to listen to more music on your own and you're finding music. And of course, like you said, with the and advent of MTV and that kind of stuff, it just saturated our our TVs. But it was great because you got exposed to all these bands or artists you wouldn't you wouldn't hear before. Especially yeah. living, you know, living in the UK, we didn't get it. I mean, we didn't really get a ton of petty on the radio. But the Wilburys, you now the Wilburys we did get because of know. obviously George Harrison, right? So sure. Wilburys was my first exposure. It's like, you know, yeah. who's this Californian dude hanging out with Roy Orbison, Bob Dylan, George Harrison, and you know, Jeff Lynn? That's weird. You know? <laughs> to English style. Uh yeah. And so that that really became my my that was my entree into the into the world and and I yeah you know, my, except my parents were pretty good they took us and my my good friend at the time Martha they took us to the uh, the full on fever uh, on the tour so that oh, was cool concert well, that was your, was that your first big rock concert then as well or not no we did okay. a couple other ones but that was my first Tom Petty big arena you know concert how many times did you see him. You know, five. Okay. Five or six. And which so always in the same venue, or did you sort of no, see? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, a couple times it was at Arco Arena in Sacramento. Oh. Okay. Uh, and I do remember very specifically the the ninety one. I think it was the ninety one tour um, because it's very theatrical. Yeah. And that's when they had, you know, a, a lot of visual things on the set. Um, yeah. And what I remember very specifically about this, what we had, I went with two of my friends. So this was kind of my go on my own with uh, old enough to yeah. go, with, go with friends. And we got floor seats. So <laughs> I, I don't think we robbed a bank. We must have been in four seats somehow. <laughs> we got floor seats. And I remember that the, I believe he ended, the band ended with, um, it's all right for now. And I wrote so with Tom Petty and, and my friends I went with, they were like six, four. They were big guys. And I, I, I'm not tiny, tiny. I'm five, six. Yeah. And I remember they, they that's the Tom Petty said, this, this is for all the, the little people in the, in the audience, meeting little kids. But my friends were pointing to me because, <laughs> ah, 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 there's so much dog. And, and, and Howie Epstein looked over and kind of, just kind of smile or like, yeah, okay, yeah, we, we get it. You bet you're being funny. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Howie's not we that big, is he? He's not a big fan. <laughs> so let's uh, see if I could find the set list to see if I could see what he played. Cause that would have been, yeah, that, that tour as you know, the, the question, one of my 10 questions is always like, if you could go back and see any gig or whatever it was, but that's one of the, like obviously the film run I would love to have seen, but that, tour like you said with the tree and with the presidents and with all the sort of the extra stuff that was going on in the show that's now it's not just a concert now it's a show right exactly so, yeah yeah well i mean oh. being a monkey fan it sort of fit right into that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, How, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah visually stimulating can we we wake up? it's funny yeah, uh, with the with the whole monkeys thing i i never understood once I sort of, you know, learned who they were and how they came about and everything but it's an odd criticism oh they they had a tv show so they're not a real band yeah. How does that make them not a real band? They're still playing their instruments and but, they're still. It's bizarre. I, yeah. I'd say so. You know, if you're a super pure ship to go through the, the current yeah. channels, quote unquote. Yeah. Wow. Well, well, but so the interesting thing, too, I know you wanted to hear a couple memories from the film war, was that was the last co- I saw that concert and I didn't see any for a while for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, until the film war and to go from that uh set to this very stripped down yeah a uh, small venue was just kind of like oh at least it's been bad <laughs> you know? so, or just so different yeah um but it, it was also very cool and, and this is something i will say about 
no matter where I was, seeing Tom Plenty of Heartbreakers. I mean, if I was on the floor, if I was on a small venue, big auditorium, uh, last concert I saw on the last tour, I was at the very, I was not on the floor. I was like the, the last row, you know? Yeah. And then, uh, but the, the love between the audience and the band was just so palpable. I mean, you can feel it. And you know, I mean, Kevin, you've been to enough shows where you can tell if the performer doesn't give yeah. a shit. <laughs> Absolutely. You can tell if they're falling it in, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Because I, well, when I saw I saw Van Halen in Saskatoon in I want to say 08, when Sammy came back and Eddie Van Halen comes out and I mean I've loved Eddie Van Halen since I was you know small and everything but he comes out sure. and he says Saskatoon you're the best show we've ever played I was like oh come on dude you've played the Forum and you've played I know we're not the best don't say that you've just kind of ruined it now. <laughs> you know what I mean so I never liked that when it's when it's insincere and disingenuous. But I never got the sense that Petty was ever like that. So that's kind of cool that it, you that was your experience. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was definitely my. Experience. I I think it would be the experience of I would guess most bands. Everyone, done everyone I've spoken to for sure. Yeah, um, but I think Ellen at band just they don't really care about their audience. I would just yeah. for the paycheck, you know. <laughs> oh, it's interesting that, like you said, if you go and see the '91 tour, which is a big. Like I said, it's this big production, probably, you know, 200 people involved in that show in lighting and, and crew and everything else. Yeah. And then the Fillmore, really, now you've got its residency. So oh, you've right. probably got a crew of maybe 20, 25 or stripped down and the set's completely different. It's a smaller room. My, my, my impression of that would be that the energy would be completely different where I, was he more, did it feel like the band was more relaxed in the yes. Fillmore? Yeah. yeah, for sure. You could tell it was a more relaxed Realized well, and I was there for the Heartbreakers beach party. No flipping way, really. Yes. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Which at the time, Kevin, I will say that's you know it wasn't social media. I I was at grad school at the time. I think I got three or four TV stations, and you know one was if you hung a clothes hanger out the window. I mean, it was <laughs> <laughs> pretty pretty bare bone. Um, so I honestly don't remember, uh, you know, having heard about the song before or what yeah. it was on or anything like that. So, it, yeah, I kind of was like, what was that? I, I just remember it being funny, but I don't remember. Yeah. I don't have a recollection of like knowing it beforehand. So it must have been really cool when, you know, the Fillmore album comes out. Oh, and then yeah. and then it's included, and you think, oh, I was there for that. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm on an album somewhere, right? Yeah. Well, what I should do actually, once and I'm, I might edit this out. We'll see. But I have when the album came out, and this uh, you'll remember on Tom Petty Nation, they sent a word out because they wanted people to host listening parties for the album, you know, on the day of release. Yeah. And so I was the only. We were the only one in Canada. So oh. in Saskatoon, we had the only listening party in Canada, and they sent us out some sort of promo stuff. So there's a um, heart, Tom Perry and the Heartbreakers beach ball for the beach party. Oh. So, so, and I've got some spare. I've definitely got some kicking around somewhere. I'll send you one because oh, I, think, awesome. I think you should definitely have one of those. Oh, oh my gosh! Oh, thank you. <laughs> and it's full of glitter. It's so cool. Yeah. So, but that was a um, yeah. The energy was more relaxed, but it was still. Uh, such an and in fact maybe even a heightened appreciation of the audience. Yeah. Um because is it was we'll it fif about fifteen hundred or so? It's a it's not many, it's right? Not it's not small no, it's not a big uh big venue. Yeah, about twelve, fifteen hundred, somewhere in there. I just want to look that up and we'll see. Thirteen hundred, yeah. That's okay. That's a small venue. But I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a performer, who's a musician, well, Randy again. And because of the shape of it, because it's essentially just a box. Right, and he said that that is exactly what you want. He said a, a fairly high ceiling. He said with the with the length, and there's not a whole bunch of stuff in there. You've got the chandeliers, and he said that's probably the best sounding room that you could ever see a band in. Oh, the you know, just just sonically, you know. Yeah, the acoustics were uh, uh, incredible. Yeah. So, which was your that? Okay, well, you, you saw the film more, and you said that the Full Moon Fever tour would have been your first time. What was the last tour that you saw? The last tour I saw was the last tour. Okay, so you did see that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in fact, oh, like, September 1st. 
Wow. Yeah. Also, that was right toward the end of the run then, yeah. Right towards the end. Because the 15th was the last one, right? I misremember that. I believe so, yeah. So we were. Wow, yeah. And in fact, the date had been, it had been post, the show had been postponed uh, by a week or so because of the laryngitis and the, right. the health issues. So it's just kind of like, well, we'd only, you know, who could have of been coming? And, and uh, you know, our area of California, we have a lot of wildfires uh, that, aren't exactly right here, but we could run a ballot all the smoke come to down. Yeah. And they've actually had uh concerts at that venue canceled because it's too smoky. That's crazy, huh? Hey? Uh, yeah. And so yeah, we're kind of used to okay, yeah, that's you know we've seen other I think you know, Justin Timberlake had to postpone his uh for something. So it, it didn't co- it didn't cause a lot of alarm, I guess. Yeah. You know, but, okay, it's another artist postponing. <laughs> <laughs> What's that thing, right? When you, when things like this, the same here with the, with I was, the, it's the same here with the cold. You know, when it gets down to minus 40, minus 45 C Celsius. Yeah. People you just think, like, you know, and there'll be warnings saying don't go outside for any longer than two minutes because your skin will freeze and exposed skin, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, think about maybe driving your kids to school instead of sending them in letting them walk today or like <laughs> and stuff. But you just, it just becomes part of you every day, right? And when it is like, it's what you had to cancel the concert because of smoke and everyone in the area just goes, yeah, we have to do that now and again. So. Right. Yeah. And I remember it was, that was a pretty smoky summer. So it was. Yeah. <laughs> and our summer is going until about Halloween. What was the, so, at that last gig, then I don't think I've asked anyone this who was at any of those gigs. What was the? Did was there a feeling in the audience? If you if you talk to people around, did was it sort of? Was there any sense that this, even because it was the 40th anniversary, was there a sense that this might be the last tour and that this might be the last time we get to see the band play? You know, I'm pretty sure that's why I went because I I kind of figured oh, this was the last big tour. Yeah. Uh, um, but that you know you almost get a little jaded sometimes with, uh, like I think with Elton Johnson. Two or three farewell tours. <laughs> yes. Kiss have been doing them since the mid eighties. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, is it really? But I thought, oh, found out chance it's really the last time I would get to see them live. Yeah. And it's always been such a such a great band to see live. Uh I better I better go. And uh, my husband's not a fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I ended up going with some friends. And in fact, I got a different. I was sitting in a totally different section than paper. We, oh, got, geez, yeah. we didn't get our tickets together. Yeah. There's something, there is something about though, I, I mean, there's the community and the sort of the social aspect of going to see a show or a movie or a theater, or whatever it might be. Yeah. But there is something special or different about seeing a show on your own, especially when it's oh. a band that you really, really love. I mean, I wouldn't always do it, but there is something about that that makes it unique and just a little bit more special in certain ways right yeah absolutely yeah and it was a, a different experience because i usually go with either my husband or I go with friends to see the show but i was just up there i know you care so i'm never gonna see people again right so, yeah. <laughs> you dance sing as loud as you want along i mean that's absolutely you're not overpowering the band and that's uh, what the show should be it, and like you said earlier it, that to me, the best shows were always where that social contract between the artist and the listener well, is is two way, right? So it's it's yeah. kind of we're here, we're playing, but there's no real line, right? There's no boundary between the band and the crowd. It's everyone's here to just have a good time. And one of the bands that I love for that is Foo Fighters. Like Dave Grohl is amazing oh, yeah, at yeah. just taking that barrier out completely. It's just a big party, you know. So. Well, and if the audience isn't in, isn't into it, I mean, I've been to some shows where oh. like uh, I heard Peter Noon from Herwin's Herwitz once call. <laughs> with a uh now I won't forget with it. Uh like a uh a, a Quaker revival is it the Quaker revival meeting or <laughs> yeah, that's the one. So, so the Quaker revival meeting. Oh, that's superb. <laughs> so I already just, Yeah. I thought, that's not fun. You know, just sitting yeah. there not getting into it. Well, that's, I don't get it. Like we, I went years and years ago now to see a, a jazz boogie woogie pa- a piano player, uh, Michael K. Samuel's name is Canadian guy, absolutely amazing, and he just tears it up. So me and my friend went, 
but we'd had a few beers before we went. So we were a little bit loose, a little bit more wobbly. And yeah. it's this very, it's in an, an auditorium and it's kind of like, you know, excuse me, sorry. It's a jazz boogie wiggle. So it's more jazz and it's more of a jazz crowd. So there's people there in suits and there's people there and it's very buttoned up and very stiff. And this guy, like I said, is just tearing the roof off the place. Me and my mate are just dancing around <laughs> like a pair of idiots. But it's like, I don't care, man. They've, that's this to me. That's how you enjoy music. Don't just sit there, you know? Yeah. Well, and it's interesting that I'm I'm not generally a real like a loose person, yeah, you know, and I, right. I don't imbibe, so it's you know I don't have any outside uh, substance that's gonna yeah. But you get me at a concert, you get me listening to my jams, and I I just loose it up. I got music by drug. I don't know. Hundred <laughs> percent though, and I I get that same thing. It's funny, like I I said earlier that I. I I don't drink anymore and it wasn't a, it was, I just decided, I, I thought, yeah, this is stupid. I'm not going to do this anymore. Yeah. But I still, I get the same buzz from listening to music. Sure. I get the same buzz from, you know, playing board games with my kids or going playing pool with my daughter that, I, you know, so you realize that no, I don't, I don't need that external stimulation. I just, I, I kind of enjoyed it, but I certainly didn't need it. And yeah, man, I still get certain pieces of music every single hair on my body is on end and that's yeah. every time i listen to a certain song you know what i mean and well, i guess that i only learned this recently that not everyone has that some people don't get that reaction to music i think how sad that is you know i you know it's interesting it's my husband and, and my my oldest i do like music they enjoy it but it's not something i think that they feel to their core yeah maybe but my youngest is actually going into music production uh, he's, oh, cool. he's always been quite musical too and plays piano, plays guitar. Uh, and so she and I are more like, all right, then the, that music is, is, it's a part of, you know, it's just a part of you. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, it's even, yeah. My, my wife's a little bit like that too. She listens to music. She loves music. Right. But not in the same way. She doesn't listen to it the same. You know what I mean? Like, and it's, that's what you're talking about, I think, is they're not, they're hearing it, but they're not really listening to it, you know. So I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I think it's the same. Yeah, just background noise, right? It's more like it's just it's just on, and it's something that's fun. No, oh, yeah, this is kind of a good song. Yeah, like, no, you don't understand. I need to know every single part about everything about this band, and I want to know everything. About it. <laughs> that obsession. <laughs> so when, like you said, you so if you come in mid late eighties, and we'd have don't come around here no more, and then Full Moon Fever. Do you remember Wildflowers? coming out or was that were you oh, sort of would you have called yourself sure. after when, yeah okay no uh, yeah and i i honestly don't remember if i bought it just because oh this was the new album coming out or if i'd heard well one of the songs on the radio and and we'll have to forget it um but yeah i definitely remember and it's probably you know of the albums i had acquired the the most frequently played yeah and has that so? And you've heard me ask this question with guests before, though. I, I, that when you're in your early twenties, mid twenties, I just can't imagine that album resonates as much as once you get a little bit older and once you get into your forties and fifties. It just it's going to connect with you on a completely different level. It hits right? on a completely different level. Like uh, just having that life experience level. I mean, it. You know, most of us, I think. By the time we were in our forties and fifties, uh, have I, well, many of us have been divorced. Uh, I'm not one of them, or or uh, ended a long term relationship. Yeah, um, I've seen somebody that a lot of struggle with addiction. I've seen someone they love struggle with mental illness. Um, have had children. Um, I watch them grow. Um. So the songs just become relatable on a different level. I, I, I think, think I want to say a deeper level, but a different level. I think it is deeper though, too, because I think you, for me at least, when I listen to Wildflowers, I, I really connect to Tom Petty as a person beyond you know beyond the music because, and especially once you know the context for what was going on and all that Better. kind of stuff, yeah, you just you can you can hear the pain at times, and you can hear the sort of him getting away from the pain and deliberately, you know, giving us something like Cabin Down Below or Honey Bee or something just to lift the mood. So all that kind of 
the humanity of that album, I guess, is what comes through for me when I'm listening to it as a as an older person. Because I didn't have this album when I was younger, so right. I don't have uh, the experience okay. of I don't have the experience of hearing it then and hearing it now. Yeah. But I've got that with other bands, right? So, sure. Uh, and I think hearing it, even hearing it after knowing, you know, like reading the biography, reading uh, conversations. And that takes it to a whole other level of, yeah. okay, what was this person going through when the song, then he was writing the songs? And I, you know, to me, it, the, that combination, he and I talk about more to me. 100%. And I never subscribed to that idea that art is pain. Like, I don't, I don't buy that. And it was really cool when I, I can't remember which song it was. And I don't even know if it was for Wildflowers. Or it might have been into the great wide open, but Paul had asked him about about that, and Tom said, "No, I can't. I can't write if I'm sad. I have to be happy yeah. to be able to create music, and and I'm the same. Like if I'm actually if I'm really down, I can't create. Like I can't, I can't think about that kind of stuff because my head's not in the right space. So it's kind right. of cool to you that. Just and of course, you... be able to function. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just one foot in front of another. That's all I'm focusing on. So it was yeah. kind of cool to see someone at this level, right, sort of say the same thing. So it's like that. Okay, well, that's even more rel- relatable. So you so get through wildfires and obviously anyone with any sort of musical ear is going to hear that album and think even if they don't love every song you can really appreciate how good that album is from a production standpoint song oh. songwriting everything so that at that point you could sort of forgive petty for saying okay well i'm in mid 40s now i don't really need to try anymore i could go into greatest hits mode but this, and again, you probably heard me say this, this is what sets him apart for me is that he doesn't do that. And we have She's the One and that's the soundtrack and that's a little bit different. Yeah. But then you get Echo and then you get Last DJ and you get Highway Companion and you get Mojo and you get you get all these albums. It's like, how is this guy still finding something interesting to say and finding a different way to say it? Well, and continuing to be relevant. Mm-hmm. So what was your experience with those late late career albums then? Like, what, did you have did you have any drop off where you sort of weren't listening to them as much and then came back? Or I always be a drop off. I always listened. To, um, I kind of I, yeah, and I always sort of had a a finger in the fandom, um, so to speak. But you know, I got pretty busy raising <laughs> raising kids and having a career. <laughs> so yeah. I wasn't uh, didn't have the uh, the time. Yeah, uh, to dedicate, but I, I do think remember, especially like, I the, the the last DJ okay. and and Echo, um, yeah. and some of the other albums I got into just uh, more recently. Uh, did a, a deeper dive. Yeah, yeah. The last the quality in the last DJ, I think. It, you know, we talk about so long after dark, which we just got the new information about. Which I mean that. Vinyl. It's like oh, it's one hundred and thirty dollars, but I've got to have it. Look at it, you know, because <laughs> um, I'm in Canada and I got to get shipped. But oh yeah, that's a really un- not underrated. Sorry, it's not the right word, but it's kind of the overlooked album from the Iovine era, right? Out of the three that he did with Jimmy Iovine, Torpedoes, Hard Promises, and then Long After Dark, that's the one that you don't hear people talking about quite as much. Well, and I think it's because it doesn't have a refugee on it, doesn't have a waiting on it, but it's still end to end. A superb album. I think the last DJ is kind of that album in Tom's late period. Either. Because mm. people don't talk about that album. You don't, you know, when Tom Petty Nation were both on there, Last DJ is not the album you see coming up again and again and again and again. And I don't yeah. know why that is because it's a phenomenal album. It, it's a great album. I, I don't even know precisely what made me get that one and not other one. I, I, you know, I honestly it was probably just a like, song on David Letterman or something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, another album coming out. Yeah, because uh, again, in the days before social media and and just the saturation of uh, information coming to you, you you might have some things may have slipped through the cracks. Maybe, yeah. I think. I mean, I don't know how much it was played on the radio because obviously it's yeah. taken a pretty big swing. Uh, you yeah, know, corporate radio, and again, Tom sort of shown his dissatisfaction with labels and that kind of stuff. So you can see how that's a, a huge risk, and that's the other thing, right? So 2002, that album comes out. Like I say, Petty's what is he? 52 by then. 
and again, could be in greatest hits mode. He could just be touring off the back, which would have been fine, right? Yeah. If he'd gone the Eagles route and just keep touring the, the greatest hits, everyone would have loved that. That would have been perfect. Yeah. But instead, he releases this album, Blast DJ, Money Becomes King, Joe, When a Kid Goes Bad. And then we get things like The Man Who Loves Women and Can't Stop the Sun, which are these two don't sound like anything he's ever you done think? before. So he's still yeah. pushing the envelope. It's just incredible. Yeah, the oh. creativity never, it never slowed down. No. And again, I mean, Have Love Will Travels on that record too. Oh. Maybe yeah. the, mm, that's probably one of the top five deep cuts, maybe. You know, Tom ever did. So wow. I suppose it was a single, but didn't really get airplay. And then, so where do you say, because I know that Mojo isn't, I don't think Mojo's universally loved amongst the petty heads because there are some people who don't like sort of the really bluesy well, aspect of it or whatever. So where, where does it sit with you, that one? Uh, yeah, I I like it. Um, yeah, one of my top top favorite songs on that album. Oh, it's just something good coming. Oh, she's left. Yeah, that um, is. Oh, it, yeah. That's just and, and honestly, that that song is is carrying me through <laughs> this yeah. past year. Um, uh, just because of things that went on in my personal life, and um, just kind of had to. You know, I almost see that as a, and I've got a church background, but it's almost like a hymn, you know, yeah, 100%. like, a, all right, this is, t- <laughs> uh, and it's interesting. I've actually passed that song on to others who have been in situations where they're struggling Yeah, and they really appreciate the doubt. Um, but I, you know, my other favorite song on there is Candy. <laughs> That's one of my favorites on that album. It's just so much fun. I but love it. so much fun. Like, yeah, I eat a lot of vegetables that I don't like either. So, and I'd rather <laughs> <laughs> so i i find both those songs incredibly related <laughs> yeah, yeah. <You're laughs> crazy though the, two most um, different ones on, yeah, yeah it's complete opposite ends of the spectrum for tom yeah on the same album produced in a way that i mean candy is loose and it's a jam song you can totally hear how that comes through those sessions but something good coming Man, that thing hits you like a sledgehammer in that. Every single time I listen to that album, I'm never ready for that song when it starts. Yeah. Well, like we said, that that I always get like a, a visceral reaction. Like I I hear those opening chords and it's like, I, I don't want to say like a gut punch because it's a, it's a yeah. positive, but it, I just feel a physical reaction when I, it, it, like something like the goosebumps, the, the yeah. hair back of your neck standing up. It's that bit that sometimes when you, you feel like your breath catches, and you get it's emotional here, right? It's right in your upper chest that- where you just kind of it's everything's tight. And I get I, I get that from that song too. And it's one of those where if I'm out running, I can't put that I can't put that on my playlist. I can't put Southern Accents on my playlist because if it, if I if it comes on, I'm going to be like, well, I can't breathe now. So. <laughs> yeah. Or when uh, when the dam just needs to burst and that song, you know, it'll come on and just like, yeah. All right, then it's uh, then it's just the cheers. <laughs> yeah. Which is a good thought. Sometimes you just need that, that re- something to spur on the release. And that's yeah. what that's how helps me with. Having a good cry is underrated. Everyone should have a good cry now and again, especially men. Because <laughs> we don't do it often enough. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, Right there with you. Okay, so did you ever see... I didn't actually, obviously, you've seen Tom a bunch of times live, but did you ever see Mud Crutch live? No. I no. wish I had. Yeah. I wish, uh, that would have been really cool. Because I, th- I wonder, you know, you were talking about um, the film more and the, it being more relaxed and feeling a bit more sort of intimate and that kind of stuff. I do wonder if that's that was one of the things that prompted Tom to consider reforming Mud Crutches. I kind of enjoyed that experience of just going playing in front of 1,100 people, 1,200 people. That was a lot of fun. So getting back to Mildred, but you can't, it's difficult to do that with the Heartbreakers, right? Because, you know, sure. it's a big business and you've got a lot of people support and it's, it feels that obligation, that weight of responsibility to keep people's livelihoods. If you do that in a, a residence, your small arenas, it's it's a little bit less. But to go and do it with Mud Crutch, where it's low key and he plays bass and doesn't have to sing all the songs, that would just that's just again that yeah, no, no, no. I I wonder. I, it's a it's a great theory and it makes a lot of sense. Um, Completely made up. Come, come I, made it, I made it up just now. <laughs> <laughs> well, and get thinking on the spot. Want to kind of come back to your roots in that way too? Yeah. Because um, it was a while between Fillmore and Mudcrutch. We, we, yeah, Fillmore was 97 and Mudcrutch. When was Mudcrutch? Was it 2013? Did that come out? No, it was I first in 2008. Like, 
what was, was that it? first album? I, mean, I want to say like early, like 2000. Oh, yeah. 2013 was Muckrush too, wasn't it? Yeah. 2008, you're dead right. Okay. And 2016 was two. Okay. I'm terrible with dates. Yeah. Awful. I remember, my, I remember my kids' birthdays and my wife's birthday. That's the only thing. I'm, as long as I remember those, I'm, I'm okay. That's all you need to know. <laughs> cool. Okay. So have you been to the Tom Petty weekend? Did you go to any of the previous ones? No, but I am going for my first time in six weeks now that I'm counting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, really looking forward to that. I just uh, I thought I want to hear more what you're going to do there. Don't know yet. We haven't, me and Dan haven't nailed down exactly. We're definitely going to be doing a trivia, a petty but trivia what? in some form. Um, and then I might do a little bit of emceeing. I'm not too sure yet, but whatever we do, it's going to be, and like I said to Dan, look, dude, I'm just down there to soak it all up, have fun. If you want me to work 12 hour days, I will do that. I'll go and open doors, sell t shirts. I don't care. I just want to be part of the event. Right. So, yeah, I feel in the same way. Uh, yeah, just uh, got, uh, Got my flights a while ago, and I just managed to get that last uh, hotel reservation made, so it's becoming more real. Yeah. And uh, this is a two-part trip for me. I'm going out to Texas first to see uh, my best friend, and then uh, for the first half of the week, and then going on to uh, Gainesville for the next half of the week. So cool. And man, did we ever time it right? Stan Lynch is going to be there, right? So we're oh, going to get to I... the Speak Awards too. Yeah. Uh, that'll be really cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a lot of really positive energy that seems to be behind it with uh, with everyone I kind of talk to. Yeah. So I think it's going to be an absolutely fun weekend, although it's like, my kids are one of my friends because I've tried to, it's oh, kind of like a music festival. It's like, is that like Coachella? <laughs> <laughs> no, not like Coachella. No. <laughs> <laughs> Different crowd, I think. Yeah. But that that's the thing with the weekend, I think, is that I, I don't really know if there is anything that's comparable to it. Certainly, I mean, there's people, you know, Jeff Slate does the Dylan thing once a year, and there's there's a bunch of different events for different artists, but a full weekend festival with different artists on, you know, for nine, 10 hours on stage over the course of two whole days. Yeah. That's pretty unusual. And I think, you know, only really petty fans could probably pull that off, I think. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. And the, and the fans just seem like such a, fantastic lot too you know there's not a lot of negativity out there on the social media um, I mean you get some from time to time but that's with any part of life but of uh, yeah just being like a bunch of fun fun loving folks and appreciate, yeah. appreciators and well and I think part of that too is we do have really within the Tom Petty online communities we have great leadership you know, well, I, mean, I know that Keith and Janet and all the mods over at Tom Petty Nation are they're on anything that if anything does happen where it's just like, oh yeah, we're getting a bit negative here, they just nip it in the bud. And yeah. It's not done, you know, coldly or cruelly. They just say, No, we don't do that here. Right. And same thing in, you know, Tom Petty fans forever. Gwen was amazing about keeping that space positive. And so we've kind of continued that on now. So I think that self regulation among the fandom with Petty fans, again, is fairly rare. Because I'll throw back to like Van Halen fandom. If you don't like drama, don't go anywhere near Van Halen groups on Facebook. It's insane how nuts those people are. Like, just enjoy the music, you know? Right. Oh, yeah. my Lord. Uh, well, <laughs> folks are folks. They're people are people wherever they are. You know, that's yeah. the thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, listen, I think we're our own accordion. This has been an okay. absolute ball. Um, yes, no doubt you. we'll talk We'll talk in Gensville for sure. We'll have to yeah, meet up sure. and say and say hi and whatnot. Um if you've got nothing that you, because you're not selling anything, this is, you know, it's always nice when people come on and not, they don't have anything to sell, but then no. I'm kind of stuck at the end with something to do. <laughs> Sorry. So how about, and I, I asked um, Mary Beth this, are you a reader? I am a reader. Give me give me three books that I should check out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hang on. Do <laughs> <laughs> you remember the title? Okay. One I just heard was the Townsend Re Family Recipe for Disaster. And of course, it's sent me backwards on the wall. Okay. Um, that was a really good, interesting book. Um, that's a newer one. And uh, I, I have terrible at remembering. You know, I've got a really good memory for <laughs> dates and stuff, but titles is <laughs> <laughs> the one thing. Um, but right now I'm reading... Uh, a couple books on just because we were there on uh, 
Alaskan uh, women pioneers, you know. Uh, yep. And coming up, coming up empty at the moment, but uh, if I. No, I know where it's not. I can leave me out to you. Yeah, no worries. Because, yeah, I mean, I, it's funny because, you know, when you grew up in England, you grow up with, you sort of conditioned to have a little bit of a disdain for America, right? It's this, it's this kind of, not trash is not quite the right word, but it's sort of everything's overdone and everything. But it's like, but for me, craft beer, America does it better than anywhere else. Rock and roll, well, it kind of comes from America. You can't, no one else can claim that one. And then uh, literature, I mean, I was reading Vonnegut, the other day, I just I just read Slaughterhouse Five, which is astonishing. Oh, yeah, I love yeah. Mark Twain. I love Steinbeck. So the the great American writers, especially Steinbeck, you know the way he, the way that California becomes this very real, very vivid place, rather than just being oh. a backdrop mm-hmm. for a story. Yeah, the, you know the, the place itself becomes part of the story. I think it's wonderful. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of American writers these days. So. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, um, different. I'm reading all the time, but. Um... Yeah, it's probably the last book I just reread. Yeah, uh, the other one in my Alaska ones were um, uh, plays by Hacker Pete. So. Yeah, well, why not? <laughs> I mean, 